Hey guys, Chris here, CG Aviator. In this video, you're going to see a real T38C instructor pilot, i.e. me, take the F5 by uh, SC Designs, i.e. this aircraft, and I'm going to take it on a typical training sortie. So this isn't necessarily a review video, but it's going to have lots of real world procedural stuff from Shepherd Air Force Base, the home of the Euro-NATO Joint Jet Pilot Training Program, of which I flew for three years. And I'm going to take this aircraft and do a, a training mission with it. So I'll talk about a lot of uh, my experience with the T38. I'll compare some of the qualities and the uh, avionics in this aircraft with the T-38, but I will caveat that I haven't flown the F-5 before, and I'll try and make that clear as we go along. So if you didn't know, the F-5 and the T-38 uh, share a common route in the N-156 by Northrop. Uh, they produce the N-156, and that branched out to the F-5 as a light attack supersonic fighter, which you can see, and also the T-38, which is a twin-seat training aircraft, which is still in service at this time, both 19, late 1950s, early 1960s vintage aircraft. So here we are in the cockpit of the F5. We're parked up at the hold short for runway 15. Non-standard, this is where we're going to start our engines uh, just for simplicity's sake. Uh, and just to show you around the cockpit, it's fairly simple uh, layout, very simple to operate or talk through. And I'll talk through some of the differences with the T-38 as we go. Canopy's already open. I'll note that it starts with the weapons in Ripple. It should be safe. And uh, let's get to starting it up. So batteries, uh, do some of that, put some generators on. These switches are already up. We'll put the beacon on. Uh, probably put the exterior nav lights on as well. Fuel boost pumps left and right, they are on. You'll notice the tooltips aren't quite assigned at these. So hopefully in an update, they'll pick off some of those. Uh, what else do we need? We're pretty much ready to start now. Uh, you will note there's a parking brake in this. You have to have a key bind for it. I don't think there's a switch in cockpit. The T-38C certainly didn't have a parking brake, and I think this aircraft would be the same just to keep it super Billy Basics. Um, so no parking brake, but here for convenience. The other thing this aircraft wouldn't have is a uh, APU or a GTS or the ability to start itself on the ground. So it relies on an air start cart. So you need to make sure if you land or operate from an airfield, they have the start cart available. Uh, and that's to uh, rotate the engine enough such that when you apply the fuel and the ignition source, it's at the right uh, fuel air uh, ratio, etc. You know, all that geeky stuff. All right, so now we need to start up. So for this aircraft, um, it's uh, it does have an off label on the throttle, but it doesn't look like the finger lifts or the shut off portion of the throttle is uh, modeled here. It'd be nice if they could do that somehow. Some aircraft models have that. Um, the other thing they have is the shut off valves here. We use this as the shut off for the fuel or the applying fuel during the start. So normally these would be up and on. So the uh, fuel shut off would be open. In here, it's down is currently open. Now this is, uh, what are we, 24th of March at the moment. So updates will probably come. But I think these switches are the wrong way around, if I'm being honest. Uh, also, you'll notice when the fuel is on, so down is on, and the cover's shut, you'll notice the switches um, come through there a bit bit of a bit of a bug but we'll work with it okay uh, the other thing you'll notice with the ignition don't know if you can hear that in the background the clicking so the these switches normally uh, energize the relay but don't start the igniters the igniters are controlled either by throttle position or the start buttons these just mean that the ignition is on so if it needs to automatically relight airborne if it has a flame out it can relight if the engine's already rotating uh, but in this case the ignition actually is uh, permanent and you can hear the clickers which is the igniters spark plugs if you will clicking in the background so let's go through the startup sequence so uh, you normally you wait for the air to be applied and then the rpm would start climbing up uh, but we don't have that so what we will do is switch on our igniters and press the start button on the right you'll notice the RPM start on all jet aircraft. You normally get to about 10 or 12 percent before you uh, apply the fuel. And now I'll apply the fuel using this switch here, and it will go through its start cycle all the way up to about 50, 55 percent. Simple stuff. Whilst that's going, I am going to uh, switch on this radio. You'll also notice I've got tooltips enabled because. Uh, it's very difficult to see if things are switched on. So this switch doesn't really move much. Uh, the other switch I'll demonstrate on is this one. So if you rotate it round, you'll notice that the uh, position doesn't actually match the labels on the outside. So I'll set that to VOR because that's what we need for the way out. And I'll talk about the departure process in a sec. And uh, 45 X-rays already on there, operating T and R. I see uh, that one's actually lined up pretty well. Okay, 50% starts uh, complete on that side. We'll do the left-hand side now. Ordinarily in the T-38, and again, I would presume for the F-5, you have to get the crew chief to go underneath the rear of the aircraft and actually use a, 
uh, wrench to change the air diverter valve across so that it rotates the other engine. Put those covers in, there we go. But in this aircraft, again, simple stuff for the model. All right, so the engine's uh, almost finished spooling up. Ordinarily, I'd monitor it for the temperatures, but I'm just going to get on with the rest of it. Lights, uh, we'll put the warning lights to bright. I'm not going to use the IFF today. Lots of switches, you get the idea, it's a transponder. There we go, I'll set it to on. We'll shut the canopy. A bit quieter, lovely. When you shut the canopy, you check it's uh, down locked. Uh, there'd normally be a canopy light, possibly somewhere. You give it a bump, make sure it's definitely locked. Uh, we can move the pins at this stage and there's no one in the back to worry about either. Uh, the pins aren't modeled. So engines are started. We put the cover switch up, so that's all good. What else do we need? We can put the radar on, I guess. I don't know what the difference between standby. It says radar and BST. No idea. We'll just put it on. Uh, that, that. Right, we've got everything set up. The final thing for the departure, the Red River 2 departure will take us to, uh, well, Red River 2 and the Mikey departure routing will take us to uh, the radial 236. So I will set this to 236. Uh, 23625 is where Mikey is. There we go. So that radial's on. We've got VOR set, and you can probably hear the beeping in the background. I'm not sure how to turn that volume down. Or uh, Anyway, it's not going to be too distracting. I think we are good to go. Everything else will pick up as we go along. I've just remembered flaps, flap indicator, I guess. That's the indicator is to auto. Lovely stuff. Right, should we get going? Uh, right, I don't know what course I'm, what course I'm going to use. Uh, bogey 1-1, one, one, shall we? Uh, so bogey 1-1, one, one, uh, ready for departure number one. There's nobody else out here. Parking brake off. We'll put the P2 on as well. Uh, so, flaps, lights... That's probably a landing light somewhere. There we go. Uh, flaps, lights, IFF, Pito, pins, uh, weapons we don't have. So we're not going to make anything else live. Here we go, runway 15. Initial part of the departure here is to head to 4,000 feet, right turn to intercept uh, the VOR to Mikey. All right, clearance, clear all around. RPM at towards 100. Brakes don't usually hold like they would in real life in the sim, and that's a bug for all uh, jet aircraft. Usually the nozzle will kick, or the fuel flow going above about 250 uh, will indicate the burners are lit. Rotating as per a T38-141, there's the rotate. So now, do it nice and gently, and then 165 is the launch, put about uh, 10 degrees nose up, gear up. I pulled out a burner a bit quick because I want to make sure I don't go above 220 with the gear traveling. The gear is now up. We'll reset that nose to 7 degrees. Push that power up to mill power. That's dry power, so no AB. And we're off and up. You'll notice the uh, HUD isn't on. It's not really a HUD. It's a gun sight. So not a primary flight reference. Okay, next event. We talk to departures. So we're passing 2,200 feet uh, on the Mikey. 300 knots there. And then we'll climb at about 14 to 15 degrees nose up, see what that gives us. Uh, so departures will give us clearance up to 16,000. 4,000 feet will turn right and enjoy the views of Wichita Falls. 4,000 feet. Attitude indicator, 30 degrees angle bank. Let's have a look outside. Usually um, American aircraft, when they have bare metal, they're very, very glossy. This one seems to be a little bit on the matte side, but that's personal preference. Let me know what you think in the comments below. All right, how's the speed holding? So speed's actually holding pretty accurate for T-38 uh, attitude, so happy with that. So Mikey as is on the 236 radial at 25 miles. I'm going to go to 265 degrees, or west is close enough. Look at that view, that's pretty special. Uh, 265 and that'll help me intercept the VOR and then go outbound to Mikey. Now I'm not going to fly all the way because it'll take forever, so I might cut the corner a little bit. That's through 10,000 feet, the speed restriction uh, ceases here, so we'll put the nose down to about 2 degrees. We'll accelerate up to 350 knots, which is close, close to the range speed for a T-38 at 22,000 feet. And we'd order, ordinarily get pushed over to uh, Fort Worth Centre. They'd clear us up to flight level 220. And I'll get the block 200 to 220. And we've already got 2992 on. So I'm talking quick, but hopefully you're following through. 
uh, with what we're doing. The next event will be to climb up to their block, uh, intercept the radial, and then what they do is push us out to a bit of airspace in the MOA, the military operating area. It's just uh, segmented airspace so that we can train whilst deconflicted or protected from other traffic. At cabin out, you'd normally check through 10,000 feet. It seems to be stuck there. Now, it's probably me because I haven't checked all the switches. I couldn't find the cabin pressure. Usually it's automatic with the cabin shut, but it seems to be stuck at uh, 25. I guess that's 25,000. Not sure. Okay, 350 knots, then we'll put the nose back up. All right. Uh, so we're currently at five miles. I've done this pretty quick. Let's have another look outside because it does look pretty cool. Nice. Right, what else are we going to do? We are now at 17, 000, uh, 17 miles. Let's um, normally it'd be 25, but uh, I'm just going to come off to the left or fly over towards this lake and do some aerobatics. Okay, we're going to say we're in the MO. I've just reset, having a bit of a practice, but we're back here. We're passing down through 18,000 feet. We're on about 400 knots for the loop. Uh, line feature, there isn't much of one on the ground here. I'll just demonstrate a couple of different uh, different issues or different techniques, should I say, uh, for looping. So you could use your instrumentation. I've set uh, 236 radial, uh, so I can use that needle as, uh, as backup information to see if I've done a straight loop or whether I've gone wonky. So we'll bear that one in mind. For the loop, I'm going for 400 knots, I'm going to use 4 to 5 G and uh, dry power, so that's mill power. And that seems to be the best way to go in terms of this model. For the T-38 you want 500 knots and you need 8 to 10,000 feet, but this aircraft can loop in about, uh, I don't know, 7,000, 6,000 feet. Right, so up to 400 knots, speed is a little bit low but I know I can get away with it. Heading 236, looking all around, clear, okay for the loop. Up we go. So I'm going to pull until the G meter hits four and a half. There we go. Try and keep those wings level because it'll put you off. Uh, you're heading. As I pull, as I go up, I need to keep the back pressure coming. Now I've got 10 units of alpha. I'll hold the 10 alpha. In the T-38, you'd look for the green donut, but that's not working here. 16,000 over the top, so we're looking at six and a half thousand feet climbed. Now I know the angle of bank has come on, so I'll just uh, keep an eye on that. Looking out, enjoy the view. Look at those shadows, look. Those are some sexy shadows. Right, as the G increases, I'll ease off. 12,000, 11,000, and then back through 10, roughly where we started, roughly at the right speed. So that works. And the heading-wise, uh, I've gone about 15 degrees off, so it's really tricky to get that bit right. But let's do a barrel roll, but using a line feature. So I've got a line feature. Road is roughly tracking that direction, so that works. 400 knots will work. Power set, and we're good to go. Yep, we go. G, that'll do three to four feet on the horizon. Starting the roll. Pulling towards that line feature. I like to go about 90 degrees off on my barrel rolls. If you converted this to a uh, clover leaf, you'd want at least six or 7,000 feet above your base in order to do that. Barrel on the way back down. Make sure that nose comes deep enough. Looking for that line feature. Scanning the altitude on the way down. 13,000 feet, 12,000 feet, and then adjusting for whatever base. So there you go, barrel roll and an aileron roll. Correction, barrel roll and a loop. Uh, let's do some low speed handling of this aircraft now. Look at, I mean, that looks cool, doesn't it? Right, let's do some G, some G. We'll climb up and we'll just assess the stall. So in fact, what I'll do now, going through 200 knots, you need a minimum of 80% set for the engines because that'll stop it compressor stalling. Uh, 16,000 feet, 140 knots, we'll go half a G, let that nose fall. This is low speed handling in this aircraft. So if I rock the wings now, you'll notice I've got full control. So that's cool. At the horizon, we're 100 knots, a full, full back stick. It stalls and then it goes into kind of a auto rotation. So the stick is back central, I believe, and it's just rolling, which is unusual. If a T-38 did that, you'd uh, when you've got back, you'd write it up and say it's not stable in the stall because the swept wing design of this aircraft, you get a lot of buff it when you stall it and it might rock around, but usually it stays within uh, within six degrees bank. Bit of icing on the canopy. I know there is a canopy demist. That one, defog. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. All right, so that's slow speed handling with regards to uh, 
installing with clean configuration. Let's put the gear down and we'll talk a bit about the rudder effectiveness. Right, so a bit of climb to get the speed off. We're at 14, 15,000 feet. We need to be at 80% RPM. Done, below 220 gear and full flap. Gear's traveling. We'll go for about 150 knots. The three greens, flaps I guess at full. Sweet, let's have a look on the outside. That's cool. All right, famously in the T38, if you kick the rudder when configured, it will roll you quite violently in the direction that you kick the rudder. So as part of the technique uh, for teaching how to fly this aircraft, and it can be used in a standard stall recovery, if I kick the rudder, it should roll to the left. But in this aircraft, when I kick the rudder to the left, it goes to the right. And if I kick to the right, it goes to the left which is opposite to the secondary effect of uh, your, which is roll, which is kind of weird. Normally you'd expect to uh, be 45 degrees bank in the direction of you kicking the rudder, or you'd be upside down if you haven't uh, removed it in time. So that is unusual, but again, I'll caveat it with I'm a T-38 experienced pilot, not an F-5 experienced pilot. Right, let's uh, have a look at the stall. So that's green donut you can see, now we're too high in alpha. You'll hear the alpha tone, double tone, and stall. So I quite like that beeper. <laughs> okay, and recover. Oh, tricky to recover. Don't want to overspeed the aircraft. So 200 knots. Okay, let's put that gear and flap up. So G is below two. Gear up, flap auto. And I think it's time to go home. Okay, time to head home, so make sure the switches are safe, uh, gear up, flap up, uh, 2992 is already set, we'd be at 12,000 feet for the recovery fix, but we'll cancel and go VFR uh, from the front mower. Uh, we won't do this too procedurally, but what I do need to do is flick over to TACAN tracking on here, just as a demonstration, TACAN 45X, and then we can change this course bar to 060, and you can see we're pretty much there or thereabouts. 12,000 feet and we should be at 300 knots because below 10,000 feet so that's the speed we want to fly at all right so this is the VFR recovery to Shepard Air Force Base now I might get some of the details incorrect so apologies for that but I'll talk you through all the features as we go the 25 miles 300 knots 12,000 feet nailed it love it uh, talking to uh, approach and we'll start at ascent so usually you can select 80% RPM 80%, five degrees nose down, ish, and it should give you about 300 knots. I'm a bit slow because I started slow, but that is a T38 descent profile, 80 and five. And that seems to be pretty accurate, so kudos, that works nicely. Uh, we're tracking inbound on the TACAN. If we're VFR, we can do what we like, but we'll uh, follow this profile and I'll talk about some of the features. So over to the left, we have uh, three lakes, one, two, three. Point alpha for the outside container visual join will be here. Over to the right, we've got Lake Wichita. And then point to Charlie is just to the south of that. So that's where we're going to track. The Americans are really, really procedural in their VFR recoveries. Because there are so many aircraft flying around here, they need a way of squeezing as many aircraft into the airspace as possible. So they have recovery fixes, VFR recovery fixes. So point Bravo is to runway um, 15, which is what we took off on. Point Charlie is to 33. So yes, I'm going back for the reciprocal runway, but we'll say there's a runway change. Uh, and Point Charlie, and I'll talk you through the altitudes. So there's a few options. Uh, Shepard Air Force Base has four runways, including the civilian one. Uh, isn't that that 80 and 5 is working out absolutely beautifully. Uh, yeah, four runways. So we can go Point Charlie for straight into Tinder. Or we can go Point Charlie for uh, initial, which is what we're going to do. We can do a falls pattern, which takes us to Lake Arrowhead, uh, which is here. And then for a straight into center runway, and from center runway we can join <laughs> to Tinder's runway. Uh, there's all sorts of different ways of doing it. We need to go down to 3,300 feet to 4,000 feet for Point Charlie, uh, which is what we're doing. I mean, this view is brilliant. Incidentally, you might have noticed that some of my shadows are a bit darker. Uh, it's not as red in terms of the, um, the color profile because I've changed NVIDIA filters to make it look a little bit more realistic in my mind anyway. I've turned HDR right down so that uh, actually sometimes the instruments are pretty difficult to see but that is i guarantee realistic in bright sunlight like this 
Okay, now we don't need the Takan. What I'm going to do with the Takan is change that over to the runway orientation, uh, which uh, the magnetic orientation is 3-3. Three, three. There we go. Uh, we're down to 4,500 feet. I'll leave the gun sight on for now. And there is Wichita Falls. 4,000 feet, so we're in the block, so that's cool. Our approach would push us over to Tinder. And Point Charlie is at this road here, where it splits off. That is Point Charlie here. Okay, I've had a little practice. I'm now going to demonstrate the VFR Point Charlie recovery for Shepard Air Force Base. Here's Lake Wichita. This is Point Charlie, or this road where it splits off, I think it's there. That's Point Charlie specifically. And it's very, very procedural in the fact that you have to call exactly where you are because there are so many aircraft that could be doing the outside container, uh, false uh, center runway, all sorts of different approaches. So 3.3 to 4,000 feet at Point Charlie. 300 knots, get excited. And you can see it better if I go, let's have a quick look. There's Point Charlie. Okay, Tinder Bogey 11 Point Charlie. Now go report initial, I think. 300 knots. And then we're going to hold 080. I think it's 080. It could even be 070. Let's cut it in a little bit just to keep it a bit quicker. And then we're looking out for Lake, uh, not Lake, Kickapoo Airport. So Kickapoo is this runway here. Out of the northern threshold, there's a road that meets another road T-junction, and that is 7 mile initial. And we'll call the 7 mile initial because people doing the outside container will be listening out for these radio calls to make sure they don't conflict with us. We've got Lake Arrowhead State Park over here, and this village here is a good reference for centre runway straight-ins, and I'll do that in a separate video if people are interested, but in the comments below if you want to learn about outside containers, straight-in approaches, etc. from an American perspective. All right, let's start cutting the corner a little bit. So by 7 mile initial, if we weren't already at 3.3 on the altitude, we should be there, which we're give or take there enough. can't get over these shadows it looks really nice okay where's this seven mile initial so here it is here's the road that comes out here's the t-junction that is seven mile initial and you can see the runway breaking out from shepherd air force base bogey one one seven mile initial and the next event will be three mile initial we want to get down to 2800 feet because that's at an altitude based on the qnh that gives us uh, 1800 feet above ground level because we work qnh and the ground is about 1,000 feet round here. Okay, we get a keen look out to the left because that's where people will be joining from the outside container. We have priority, but you always want to keep a good lookout. And they'll be flying down this road to rejoin back to initial if they were uh, in the outside container. We're checking Delta Tinder Center lined up with Tinder. I'm a little bit to the right, but this is Delta Taxiway, this is Tinder Runway, this is Center Runway, and this is Kuta, which is the T6 short runway. Uh, the three mile initial point is going to be uh, waterworks, which is down here somewhere. I'll point them out. In fact, have I passed them already? Keep a good look out. I think I've passed them already. Back there. Three mile initial. Oh dear. And we're looking at uh, fuel quantity of below a thousand. So I'm going to use T38 speeds of 180 for my final turn and 160 for my final approach. I think that's a little bit fast for even this aircraft. So I might take a few knots off that. And we're gonna break before the tower, first 3000 feet of the runway. So here's the tower down to the left, clear in the direction we wanna break. And here we go. We'll pull the power a little bit just to bleed the speed. I'm going for below 220, T38 speeds again. Spacing wise, I know there's a, a white marquee on the ground. I think that's it here, spacing wise. Speed's looking good. All right, we'll do a touch and go, and then we'll do a close pattern pull up. Use my heading bugs. I set to set the runway orientation on there. Below 220, gear. I'm gonna go flat full, because I like to select it manually. 180 is the speed we're after. Keeping 2,800, looking for my perch point. Okay, gear and flap. Perch point is uh, being this section here. That's the one mile road from the threshold, so that section. 
and just keep it out a bit slow get that speed back there we go right bogey one one base gear down six degrees angler bank holding 180 around the turn a few clicks of back trim and keeping that 60 bank really important to keep 60 bank because this aircraft does not have an excess of lift and you do not want to get too tight we'll keep it coming down keep it coming down looking cool looking at the pappies one about 300 400 feet on rollout so 13 to 1400 feet on the altitude pull that power back because i want it to be back at 160 so i'm way fast okay rollout was decent slight overshoot there's 160, still a bit fast, looking at the AOA, want green donut. Green donut. Oh, a bit long as well. Ooh. Go up. Hey, that's not bad, I'll take it. A bit messy short final. So we'll stabilise ourselves, usually I should be, oh, I should be on the right hand side. Let's have a quick look, with the nose wheel off. Tidy. Put uh, dry power back in, mill power. Lower that nose to stop getting airborne too soon. Now we're up. Speed's good. Gears up. Flaps to auto. Gears up low to 20. Flaps up. We'll lower the nose. And we're going to do a close pattern pull up. I'm going to go 300 knots. Keep that climb coming. Clear and close pattern pull up. Pull. Like that. Roll. Like that look at the altitude 2000 feet for 2800 overbank slightly and do not get tight so it's really easy with extra speed to turn tight pull the power because we want 220 knots 2800 feet and usually i'd look for a b52 parked around about here so that's what i'm going to go for i'm a bit low maybe one one downwind land or full stop should i say don't want to configure too early because it's a uh, quite a long runway keep the speed up we are ready to configure so speed's good it's the tower our speed's going to be 160 180 like they were before in fact you know what 150 170 should we try that because the last time it's a bit fast the bloaty 20 gear flap full nice right how are we looking spacing looks reasonable lights reasonable speed's reasonable hey it's all working out here <laughs> all right this will be full stop so if you enjoyed this video if you want to see more like it uh, chuck it in the comments please consider liking and subscribing it's always much appreciated and here is my final turn pull the power 60 bank about five to six degrees nose down trim 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 back there's the green donut happy with that keep that nose low otherwise we're just not going to get the altitude off uh, bogey one one base go down if i didn't already say it and interestingly they don't give you clearance to land here on tinder's runway so no news is good news kind of weird but that's how it works and it does work because uh, we're full stopping we'll land on the left of the runway a bit fast looking at that 170. it's looking too bad about 100 feet high correcting for 150. pappies pappies are good Okay, come on, let's go. Make this a good one, 150. It's a little bit fast. Yeah, that's better. Idle, flare. Yeah, it's a bit firm, it's a bit firm. I'll take it. All right, ordinarily in the T38, you'd air a brake. In fact, you didn't need to air a brake on such a long runway because it's, it's 13,000 feet long. But for demonstration purposes, let's lower the nose by 100 knots and pull the brake chute. I can stay straight whilst flying from outside, and there's the brake chute. Sweet, that was a lot of fun. I hope you enjoyed it. Until the next time, take care and fly safe.